public uh, for public comments. We'll wait till the end. Jot down your question, and we'll try to answer as many as we can uh, throughout that. Uh, Tammy just is passing around a sign-in sheet. If you all can make sure you sign in, that would be greatly appreciated. And am I missing anything? Looking at the board member, Dylan. Are we good? Okay, so what we'll do again, Kurt Steele, uh, Flathead Force Supervisor. I am the chair, the acting chair right now, and I say acting because I'm filling in for Bill, Bill Avey, who retired in January. So um, if we don't mind, just going around the room and uh, let me know who you are and what your affiliation is. That would be appreciated. I'm Cecily Castello. I'm a research biologist with Montana Fish Wildlife Parks. I oversee the monitoring program, which is an interagency. I'm Neil Anderson. I'm the wildlife program manager for Region 1 Northwest Montana of Kalispell, and I'm filling in for Jim Williams, who retired recently. Katie Stevens, Bureau of Land Management. I'm the Western Montana District Manager and um, cover the Butte, Missoula, and Dillon field offices. I'm Hillary Cooley, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Prison Bear Recovery Coordinator. Right. I'm an advisor, but I'm also sitting in for Ben Connor, who's a member of uh, Craig Glazier with USDA's Wildlife Services. I'm the District Supervisor out in Helena. And I'm not okay. <laughs> Chris Horstall, I'm with uh, Montana DNRC. I'm up going in for Ross Beatty, who was on a subcommittee but retired in December. I'm Joan Waller, wildlife biologist at Glacier National Park. Kate Hammond, I'm the acting superintendent at Glacier National Park. Many of you knew Jeff Mao, the former superintendent, who also retired at the end of December. There's a trend here. <laughs> Warren Nero and Seth Cardinari. I'm the district ranger out of Eureka for the Eureka National Forest. I'm Rob Gump. I'm the uh, district ranger on the Lincoln Ranger District, Helena, Lewis, and Clark National Forest. Sorry, Kate, I'm Bill on this. So, Bill Avey retired. <laughs> Emily Platt was hired in her place here just a few months ago, and I'm filling in for Emily. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, I'm Dylan Tabish. Uh, I work for Montana Fish and Wildlife Parks as our regional communication and education program manager and serve on the IG or the NCD subcommittee as the information education and outreach chair. So I believe we have, do we have any other board members? How about online? You should have some board members online. Can you just raise your hand if you don't mind? Randy. Yeah, good morning, Randy Arnold, uh, Regional Supervisor for Fish, Wildlife and Parks for our Administrative Region 2. Excellent. Thanks, Randy. Then Joe, then we'll go Carolyn. Good morning, Joe Wiegand. I'm the Missoula District Biologist with Montana Department of Transportation. Ms. Upton. Carolyn Upton, I'm the Forest Supervisor on the LOLO. Excellent. Chad, then Gary. Good morning, I'm Chad White. I'm a grizzly bear management specialist for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and I'll be giving an update for Region 4 today. Yeah, Gary Bertolotti, Regional Supervisor out of Great Falls for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, also the Vice Chair of the NCD. Good morning, everyone. I'm Garth Mowat. I'm the Large Carnivore Specialist for the <laughs> Province of British Columbia. George. George Edwards, Montana Livestock Law Sport Executive Director. All right, Slick. I hope we covered everyone there. Buzz. Did I miss someone? Buzz coming out. Buzz. Go ahead, Buzz. Sorry. Maybe not, Buzz. Anyway, you're off to you. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> My name is Buzz Cobell, I'm director of the Blackfeet Fish and Wildlife Department. Come zooming in today. Excellent. All right, speaking. <clears throat> All right, Carrie. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> My name is Carrie Enos. I'm the uh, 
Wildlife Program Manager with the Confederated Salish Kikuki Tribes Wildlife Management Program. Excellent. So appreciate you all. So we are trying the hybrid model. It was kind of last minute. Uh, we got some uh, folks that uh, I'm not going to say had some concerns, but in general voice that they would like to try a hybrid model. So I really appreciate uh, Pammy McKenzie, who's my public affairs officer, stepping in to try to make this uh, work. Uh, this would be our first hybrid uh, NCDE meeting. And so we'll see how it works and it might be something that we want to discuss. Uh, later on if we want to continue that uh, moving forward. And obviously it does take some technical expertise, so I do have to pull in someone just to to do it. So it is, uh, I'm not going to say a burden, but it does take more effort, if you will, to pull off. Uh, and uh, the Yellowstone ecosystem did an in-person meeting and they did not do a hybrid meeting. And then the Bitterroot ecosystem uh, did try to do a hybrid meeting. So we're kind of all trying to figure out how to work in this post, post COVID, or I guess still pre or during COVID, but this, this new norm that hopefully we'll, we'll be moving into. So with that, really appreciate the time. Um, anybody, so a couple agenda changes. Um, Hillary, you had mentioned that uh, you were going to bring in a, a topic for yours. You want to quickly just talk, introduce HIP, right? Yeah, yeah. So I have a 10 a.m. spot. It's not going to take the full 30 minutes and there's a group of us, Carrie Enius and Joe Wiegand, we wanted to bring up a, an issue that's uh, just kind of come about recently that people should know about private camp, camping on private land, the hip camp issue. So you'll hear more from Carrie and Joe. It's just, you know, an FYI, and hopefully we have some discussion about, want to bring awareness to it, but also see if there's even a subcommittee we can figure out how to help the situation. Excellent. And then uh, Mark Ruby and Michelle had mentioned they're going to give an update on motorized. Motorized access report or uh, biennial motorized access density report. There we go. So that'll happen during the 11 a.m. Uh, NCD conservation strategy discussion. That shouldn't take the full 30 minutes that we have allotted. So uh, that's what we're, we're going to be uh, trying to do. Uh, I did also see that we didn't put in a break, uh, so we'll try to make time for a, a 15 minute break if, if time allows. Otherwise, we plan on taking lunch at 1130 to 1230. Um, there is quite a few options to go eat if you just head east. Um, that's that's what I know, and we'll try to adjourn uh, by 2 p.m. today. With that, any other agenda topics? that are on the agenda that we want to bring up and possibly fit in board members or subcommittee members. I do have a quick ask, Amy Menias, if you can hear me, if you would turn your cameras off, um, that would help us in here with the screen. All right, so with that, I will. Um, Introduce. I sit in front of the computer so I have my notes sure can. To, to get me going here. Hopefully that'll work. Okay, well, I still have it. And bear with us again, the hybrid aspect uh, makes it a little more complicated to try to make it so that folks online can see everything that we are seeing in here. Yeah, <laughs> 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 
Someone's cell phone over here is on. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. 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 It is probably Craig. Yeah. <laughs> it's spam. It's spam. Look at it. It's the U.S. government. <laughs> Those are my favorite. Hey, Craig, your car warranty expired. Your <laughs> <laughs> student loans are <laughs> hard for you so folks, folks online, if you guys yeah. can hear, you're going to hear some noise because we're having technical difficulties at uh, 15 minutes in. So, <laughs> no, nope, it's nobody's fault. <laughs> folks, this is uh, this is a guinea pig and trial by error. So I expect this to occur many times today. This is uh, why we originally threw out not doing a hybrid model because it does take uh, more more challenges. Mark, Mark Ruby at the rescue. Well, that's probably the slash IT. IT guy. He's a man of many talents. He's a man of many talents. So, Carolyn Upton, because I know I can call on you, can you see a green screen that says field data collection? I can. All right, we are successful. <laughs> Uh, I don't think I can change it. All right, well. Well, sorry, this isn't quite all on the screen. Get a little harder, I think, but. Um, so I just want to give an update on our um, research and monitoring and the trend monitoring program in the NCDE. Um, and I want to acknowledge all the members of the team and the uh, different agencies that um, are a part of this program. Uh, the main things I'm going to talk about today are the field data collection, uh, the conservation strategy demographic objectives, and, um, <laughs> uh, and uh, a management summary. We have finally managed to get a conflict and management database going, and I can report on that for the first time as on an ecosystem wide basis. So uh, that'll be really exciting. Uh, just to remind everyone, I want to uh, describe the different parts of the NCDE ecosystem. The PCA or uh, primary conservation area is the same as the recovery zone, which you see in the blue. Um, and then zone one is an area around it 
those two zones together make up the demographic monitoring area, which is the area that we do all of our population monitoring within. Um, and then we have zone two, which um, is meant to be a connectivity area between the NCDE and the Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, within zone one, we have uh, the Salish and the nine mile connectivity areas, which are supposed to help uh, connect air bears between the NCDE and the Cabinet Yak and the Bitterroot ecosystem. And then we have zone three, which is more of the prairie habitat um, to the uh, to the east of the of the DMA. So for our field data collection, I did present a lot of this in the fall update, and so I'm just going to very briefly hit on some of the, the high points. For the trend research, we captured 12 bears in 2021. Uh, for management or other research outside of the DMA, we captured a total of 61 bears. Um, if we include bears that we had collared in previous years, for trend research, we monitored 24 different bears during the year of 2021, and we monitored 45 bears with radio telemetry for management or other research outside of the DMA. Um, we try to keep 24, or I'm sorry, 25 radio collared females at all times um, on the trend project, and we're a little bit below that right now. Um, partially because of, you know, the impacts of COVID and the field work that was a little bit disrupted by that, but we're going to try to get that back up to numbers that we want to have. Um, for independent survival monitoring, um, within those radio collared samples, we had radio, three radio collared deaths. Um, did I just mess up? <laughs> okay. And she was trying to move. There we go. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. All right. We had um, three research radio collar deaths among our trend research project. One was in natural mortality, where we think a, a bear actually died because her den collapsed. Um, we had one bear that was removed due to an injury. She had been hit more than once by a car, and so it was a humane removal. And then we had one male that was probably poached. Um, within the uh, management or other research sample. These were all management bears, actually. We had one management removal, one illegal defensive property kill, and two probable poaching um, kills. Um, and then for reproductive monitoring within our radio collared sample, um, that includes both research and management bears in this tally. Um, we were able to identify the reproductive status of 34 different females that were at least four years old. We had seven that had cubs of the year, five that had yearlings, four that had two-year-olds, one that had three-year-olds offspring with her, and 17 that had no offspring. Um, we were only able to get multiple observations on three litters of cubs, including five individuals, we know um, from um, seeing whether or not they they remained with their mother over the course of the year. It looks like three of them um, lived till the end of the year, and two we know um, or we suspect died because they were not not present with their mother anymore. Um, for yearling survival, we monitored two litters with four individuals. One was still with its mother at the end of the year, and three were missing and likely dead. Um, this is a map of where our uh, captures occur in the ecosystem. Uh, the circles are the um, uh, research captures and the squares are the management captures. Um, for documented mortalities, we had a, a total of 44 mortalities that happened inside the DMA. Um, including three, 33 bears of independent age, that's two years, eight, two years old or older, and then we had 11 that were dependent young. Um, outside of the DMA, we had 11 mortalities, eight being the independent bears and three um, it, uh, dependent bears. And I just wanna 
uh, draw your attention to those independent variables inside the DMA. The, those numbers will come into play again a little later when we look at the demographic objectives. Um, and this is a map of where the mortalities occurred um, within the ecosystem. Most of them were in zone one or on the edge of the, the periphery of the uh, recovery zone or outside of the recovery zone. And we did have that one that occurred way out in the snowy mountains, which was a management removal for um, livestock depredation. It was um, the furthest east we've had a bear that died. These are the um, causes of death that we saw among the sample. The blue lines represent the average number of bears that die per year for the period, uh, the 10 year period of 2011 to 2020. And then the orange line is 2021. Um, you can see that we had um, a few more uh, livestock removals than um, were on average. Uh, also automobiles, we had a number of those, a higher number than average, and we had a, a little bit higher average on the poaching and malicious. Um, we did not have any train mortalities this year. We did not have any mistaken IDs. Um, this is another, I, I thought I'd go through the, I, I took those causes of death and I put them into these um, one, two, three, seven categories, kind of combined some of them. And I wanted to look at them um, for the independent bears again within the three areas of uh, the PCA zone one and outside of the DMA. So this is a graph going from 2004 to 2021, a 17 year period. Um, you can see that uh, the there is no real trend of the numbers of mortalities inside the uh, recovery zone or the PCA um, in any of those. And you see that, you know, during most years, we we pretty much have all of them represented as a cause of death. It's a very different story when you look at zone one. There's been a significant increase in the number of mortalities that are occurring there as bears are beginning to um, expand their their distribution and expand their density within um, region within zone one rather. Um, and it does look like in recent years that perhaps management removals are becoming a little bit higher proportion of those um, deaths in zone one. And then outside of the DMA, we're still relatively low numbers of bears that are dying, but we again see that they die from all the various causes of death, even outside of the recovery of the DMA. Um, I wanted to give a brief talk about some work that we've tried to do um, to try to get a little bit more information about bears in the wilderness. These, this is, uh, a map of the three wilderness areas that are kind of in the interior of our recovery zone, the Great Bear, the Bob Marshall, and the Scapegoat Wilderness. Um, we have a really hard time really getting very much information on bears that live there. Um, we do try to trap in there when we can. It usually is restricted to um, later in the year when we can get access in there. So a lot of times we're not in there till to, till July or August to do our trapping. And we often don't have very good luck in there at that time of year. So we decided to try to put out some remote cameras so we could kind of get an idea of where we might see bears, where we might target for trapping. And then we were also interested in trying to get, see whether or not we could document females with offspring in some of those wilderness BMUs um, with the use of camera. So um, we started putting out cameras in 2018. In the first year, they were cameras that were put out in the spring and picked up by the fall. Starting in 2019, we used some cameras that we were able to leave out over the winter, which gave us the opportunity to document bears earlier in the spring. Um, and that, that's what we did during 2019, 2020, and 2021. Um, and overall, we had 39 different cameras. And um, if we exclude the time when bears were likely in the den, we had about 4,000 days that we documented um, with uh, pictures. 
And we were able to get 21 pictures of bears. Unfortunately, none of them there were, were females with offspring. We actually only saw one black bear with offspring um, amongst all of those photographs as well. And we were able to collect two DNA samples um, from <coughs> two of the bears that were photographed. Um, and this is a map of the, uh, the areas where we had the cameras with some of the results. Um, it's a little hard to see here, but the, the ones with the dots, the small dot represents one that was had a camera that detected a bear in one year. With the larger dot, it means they had they detected them in more than one year. The empty ones, uh, there were no detections. And then unfortunately, those ones with the little X are cameras that were stolen. <laughs> and so we were not able to even see what came back from those um, options. And the cross-hatched area up there is the Continental Divide Bear Management Unit. And that's the one that we have the least observations of females with just be, you know, because of the remoteness of it. And we haven't had radio collar bears that have kind of used any of that area. So um, that was a, an area of particular targeting so that we could see whether or not we could document females with cubs. So we're not really sure uh, we're going to do a little bit more analysis on it. One of the things that we haven't really looked at the ratio of feet. We do have pictures of hikers as well on the cameras, and we we may do a little bit of a correlation between the number of hikers and the number of bears. And so far, we just our gut is telling us that there probably is a negative correlation there. And a lot of the pictures that we did get of Grizzly bears was during the spring before there were very many people on the trails, um, which is also part of the reason that we don't have very good luck when we're trapping near trails um, during our wilderness trapping efforts. Um, another thing I just wanted to touch on is uh, another um, data stream that we do is we do collect opportunistic samples of hair or um, when we encounter them, these include times when there's been a conflict and maybe the, the managers might pick up a, a, a hair sample at a conflict site, but there's also um, kind of backcountry sites where we just find a, a, a rub tree or a bridge or something that bears have rubbed on and we will collect those samples. And we send those in with the rest of our DNA samples from captured bears. And it gives us an opportunity to identify a few more individuals. Um, and in uh, in 2021, we had 30 34 bears that were identified among these opportunistic samples. Um, 12 of them were new individuals, and 22 had been previously identified. In 2020. Yes, you're right. Yes, we don't have 2021. Yes, yeah. these are 2020 data because we're always a year behind yeah. on our genetic analyses. So, thank you, Lori. No problem. Okay. Um, this is just a map of where those opportunistic samples were collected. <clears throat> Again, most of them were in re, um, zone one. We did have a few that were inside the the recovery zone. OK, so the next topic I'm going to talk about the conservation strategy demographic objectives, which um, you can read about in the, the conservation strategy. The first being the occupancy thresholds. Um, we are trying to maintain documented presence of females with dependent offspring at least every six years in 21 of the 23 bear management units of the PCA or recovery zone and between um, in at least six of the seven occupancy units of zone one. Uh, this is a map of what we saw in 2021. Um, so this is just this is not this whole six years. This is just actually what we saw in 2021. So we had um, most of the we had observations of females with offspring in most of the units um, with the exclusion of a few of those um, in the associated with the wilderness. We didn't have any in the nine mile connectivity area this year and up there by the Canadian border at Murphy Lake, we didn't document anything this particular year. Um, but when you look at it over the last six years, um, all of the units have had um, bears uh, um, occupying them at least once over the six year period. Um, 
within the PCA. And then here within zone one, all of the units have had um, occupancy um, during the last six years and pretty good occupancy even in zone one. Um, our second objective is the independent female survival threshold. And this is using a six year running average. We want to maintain an estimated annual survival of independent females that maintains a projected 90% probability that the population is above 800 bears. And for the 2021, that threshold is a survival rate of 0.93. Um, just to give you a, a little bit of a refresher about how we come up with these numbers, we uh, we project the population forward. This was the, the population um, estimate in 2018. We projected it forward, and that would give us an estimate of 1,114 bears in 2021 would be our estimate. And then we take the, uh, the projection and we use different female survival rates, assuming the lowest male survival rate that's allowable and then we determine what the minimum female survival rate would be. So that's how we come up with that 0.93 for 2021. And our survival met that limit in um, equal that of value in 2021. So our survival rate is 0.93 among our radio collared sample. Um, and then our, um, our next objective is the independent mortality thresholds. Again, we're using a six year running average and we limit the annual estimated number of total reported and unreported mortalities to 25 females and 30 males um, given our 2021 threshold. And if you recall, I was kind of pointing out that one line in our table of mortalities. These are the independent bears that were um, documented to have um, died in in the DMA, we take those numbers and we divide them into categories. And for the ones that were reported, um, we divide them into um, causes of death with high reporting rate versus low reporting rate. And then we um, try to estimate the number of um, total estimated reported and unreported mortalities. So it basically um, accounts for bears that died that we don't know about because we didn't find their carcass or they weren't radio collared. And the estimated total mortality for females is 24 and for males it's 27 using those. Then we look at that on a six year running average and this is how they um, are applied to the limit. And the orange line here represents the threshold that we're trying to stay below in terms of number of mortalities. And this blue line is the six year average. Um, and then the, the two shaded parts are the reported mortality, the ones that we know about. And then that blue area above is what we're bumping it up to try to estimate the number that were unreported. So we are staying below these mortality limits for females. And this is the graph for males. We're also staying below the limit for males on the six year running average. So we've met all of the demographic recovery or de demographic objectives that are outlined in the recovery plan or in, in the conservation strategy. Sorry. Um, the last thing that we do according to the conservation strategy is monitor genetic and demographic connectivity. Uh, the first is we estimate space, the spatial distribution of the population biennially. We did that last year, and so we did not repeat that analysis yet. We'll do that again next year. But we do take all of those genetic data that we have available to identify the population of origin for individuals and then see whether or not there's been any documented movement between ecosystems. Um, and for uh, be looking at between the NCDE and the Yellowstone population, we can do this genetic clustering to see how new genetic, new genotypes cluster went, um, into the two populations. And at this 
use, with data going up to 2020 for both of the populations, we have no evidence that we've had an immigrant come into either of the populations from the other one. Um, in comparing the Yelp, the NCDE to the cabinet yak population, we did have one bear that was actually captured by Tim Manley over there in 2020 in the Stillwater watershed, and he was identified as an offspring of a female that lives in the cabinet mountains. So, uh, and last, he's actually been recaptured and is collared, collared at this time inside the DNA, but he was born in the cabinet yak. Um, so far, we have not had any evidence that bears that make these movements between the cabinet yak and the NCDE have interbred yet. We still don't have that evidence. Um, speaking of, you know, bear movements, large scale movements, I did want to talk about three very interesting um, bears that have moved well outside of the, the uh, NCDE. Um, the first one, that blue bear, is uh, a bear that was captured in the fall of 2020. Yes, fall of 2020. Um, and that's the, you may have heard his nickname of Lingenpolter. He's the one that lives south of the highway and had so much trouble trying to get back across the highway. Um, we discovered who his parents are, and they are both bears that were captured and monitored in the uh, Mission Mountains, and you can see there the the uh, mothers are uh, identified. Their their each of their years that they were monitored are identified with a symbol, and the females are the triangles. The fathers are the squares. But anyway, his parents live in the the uh, Mission Mountains, or last we knew they live in the Mission Mountains. And if you look at the distance between where his mother lives and where he apparently appears to have set up his new home range, it's 128 kilometers. Um, the second bear is the bear that was um, identified and um, photographed by the US Fish and Wildlife Service during their um, uh, camera surveys, trying to see whether or not they could identify bears that um, are in the area between the NCDE and the Bitterroot ecosystem. Um, and that bear, uh, we don't know the, uh, or yeah, sorry, that's the yellow bear. Yes, and uh, that bear, um, the parents live right on the edge of the recovery zone on the southern end. Um, and that distance is here. 140 kilometers from the mother to that um, air bear. We don't know whether that bear has kind of settled in a home range or not. It might still be dispersing, but that is the distance that we have for that. And then we have a camera a photograph and a DNA sample that was taken in the big hole by people in carnivores that are working with some of the landowners down there. We were able to get a genotype from that. Uh, we do not know the mother of that particular individual, but we did ident identify the father, and the father lives 214 kilometers away um, on the closer to the east front. Uh, the mother might live closer, but in any case, those are fairly significant dispersal distances, um, and they are much larger than the area that exists between the NCDE and Yellowstone at this point. The distance between the distributions of those two populations are down um, closer to 60 kilometers, so less than half of those distances. So that's just kind of really interesting information for us. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about our management database and uh, give you some information on what we what we learned about that. So. We put together this management database. We started it in 2020 and we're still making a few tweaks to it to try to make it um, as usable as as we can. But the main things we're trying to re to do is record human grizzly bear conflicts, record pr the preventative actions that the, the managers are using. And then it's a place where they can re record observations, including females with offsprings and some of those outliers. 
um, and then they can record where they pick up these opportunistic DNA samples so that we have really good information about where they came from. So these are the data from 2021, um, and I we have five general categories of the types of conflicts. These are actual conflicts that um, uh, were recorded within the different units um, within the NCDE. Um, and we, look, we include unnatural foods where bears are accessing or trying to access unnatural foods, depredation, property damage. Much of that is when bears are trying to access food. Um, human interactions, which includes um, where times when bears get very habituated or food conditioned, um, aggressive encounters or injuries or fatalities, and then agriculture and crop damage. Um, as you can see, the number of uh, conflicts is very much the highest in Region 1 um, and uh, kind of doubles or is, it is quite large compared to uh, most of the other regions. Um, I should note that the data is incomplete for the Blackfeet Reservation. They had some computer glitches and lost their electronic information, so we're hoping that we can add to this later. The information represented in, the, in these data for the Blackfeet only include the times when they captured a bear because we have that information in our data. All right, this is a map um, showing where the more where these uh, conflicts occur and the colors on the these are taking them and putting them into seven kilometer grids and counting up the number of conflicts within these seven kilometer grids. We're trying to protect people's privacy by not giving the exact location, um, but you can see that um, much of this in region one, which is um, up there on the, the northwest side, a lot of it is right along the edge of the recovery zone where um, bears are living right next in, to um, pretty large um, human populations. Uh, and then we have um, significant numbers um, on, the, on the other periphery as well. Um, and then we do have that one that's way out there in the Snowy Mountains. And then we have a few that are, are in zone one and even south of the ecosystem. We did include um, these ones that were south of the ecosystem because many of them were likely involving that bear that we know came from the NCD. So I thought I'd go through um, the different categories of conflict each individually, and we can look at them um, relative to how many there were in each of these different jurisdictions. Um, and the first category, which is natural food conflicts, um, unfortunately we see that 50% of them involve garbage. Um, I find this very disheartening. We've had bears have been listed for 47 years now, and it, it's hard for me to believe that we are this far into it and we're still talking about garbage, but that's the way it is. Um, we have a lot of work to do, to in, especially in zone one in these areas between these ecosystems to make sure that we have places that bears can live without getting into conflict. And much of these unnatural food are highly preventable types of conflicts, and I think that we could do a heck of a lot better. Um, the second category, which is depredation, um, it's interesting to note that chickens account for the highest number here. You know, when we talk about depredation, most people, their mind immediately goes to livestock, and it's not insignificant, the number of livestock conflicts, but chickens are by far the bigger thing. And again, it's another sort of conflict that is highly preventable and we could do better. Um, property damage, those numbers are a little bit lower. Most of this is also occurring because bears are trying to get that food. Sometimes they are actually um, damaging things like chicken coops, um, but sometimes they are trying to enter buildings and um, vehicles and even walking into camps and being a little bit bold in that regard. 
So um, among the human interaction conflicts, um, most of them were aggressive encounters where there wasn't any injury. There wasn't really a contact made, but a bear, um, you know, someone felt threatened by the bear and there was an aggressive encounter. Um, 20 27% of them involved habituation, probably where a bear became bold after becoming food conditioned. Um, and then unfortunately we did have that one fatality down in the Obando area this year. Um, and then the last category are um, uh, agriculture or crop damage. Orchards accounted for about half of those. And in this case, some orchards are just the fruit trees in people's yards, we put them in this category. Um, uh, and then beehives for another category, which is again, a highly preventable sort of conflict. So. Um, and then just to wrap this up, this is a comparison of the 2020 data and the 2021 data. You can see that overall we had 286 conflicts in uh, 2020, 272 in 2021, the categories are very similar in their distribution. Um, and uh, that's where we are. Um, we comparing the two years, I did want to uh, report also the bears that were captured um, either because of a conflict or trying to prevent a conflict because a bear was near people. Um, so those preempt Preemptive captures are times when bears are kind of in the area around people and there's a there's a, a effort to capture the bear and move them out of there before they come a conflict. We do have um, times when we set a uh, trap for a conflict bear and we end up capturing another bear. So those orange bars are for non target captures. Usually those bears are also relocated at least the site of the conflict. Um, and then the gray bars are where bear, target bears were captured and translocated, and the yellow bars for, for times when the bear was captured and removed from the population. And lastly, I just wanted to say that we also had um, 61 instances where the bear managers were doing pre preventative actions. Um, those included times when there was a bear in an area and they were trying to secure attractants. Um, and then the other parts were times when they were just responding to an to a need to try to secure attractants. Um, so these are preventative actions that really were not involved specifically with a conflict. <coughs> and with that, I would like to acknowledge the various people that um, help with the field work and collecting all of these data, and I can answer any questions. Thank you so great. All right, so we're a little behind, but let's take and see if there's any subcommittee questions. Um, let's take five minutes to see if we don't have any questions. That's okay. But Neil, just a question on your your livestock depredations. Okay. Um, could you break that down by geographical area? I'm imagining that most of the chicken pumps um, occur over on this side and then you get more livestock. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but but there's a little, it is a little mixed. It's not entirely so, but by far the most chicken um, uh, depredations occur in region one. Online. Oh. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. So we're going to transition then to Dylan. Uh, we'll see how we do in transition. Another nope. Oh, I'll keep it simple. Awesome. Well, thanks, Cecily and Kurt. Um, you know, I'm just going to give a brief update from the information education outreach 
subcommittee for the NCDE. Um, we are the, the subcommittee, the IEO subcommittee for NCD uh, features uh, myself and uh, Chiara Cipriano from Helena Lewis and Clark Forest. Um, we're a little light on subcommittee members right now, so I would ask for all the other, uh, all of you in the room, if you have staff who you think would be uh, good to have on our subcommittee, I'd love to have a few more members on it. We've, we've lost some folks to retirement and moving on to different positions, so that's why it's just me and Chiara right now on this subcommittee, but if you have any staff or know anyone who you think would be useful on that subcommittee, please uh, send them my way. I would love to add them. That, that subcommittee, the primary role is to review the grant requests that come in annually for information, education, and outreach efforts. Uh, for example, we funded three, three or four this year in the NCDE including $3,300 to the Swan Valley Bear Resources Conflict Mitigation Program run by Swan Valley Connections. Uh, that's been a long time program that uh, Luke Lamar and others have ran down in the Swan. It's been very successful and we've supported them with an ITBC grant. Uh, we also have awarded $6,000 for the Bridging the Gap Living with Grizzly Bears Outside of the Recovery Zones uh, program. Uh, and that's uh, kind of helped been worked with the Helena Lewis and Clark staff uh, have worked with some organizations over there uh, to work on uh, education and outreach uh, in that area. And then $5,600 for the Casanca District Bear Ranger up in the Kootenai National Forest. Um, and that's been another successful kind of education effort to support the IGBC grants. So these grants, we got we get tons of grants annually uh, for across the IGBC uh, ecosystems. And that those subcommittees for each of these subcommittees help review, rank, and choose uh, which programs get supported and uh, always want to have as many uh, perspectives on that committee as possible. We also just have conversations and discussions about how we could try to address some of the, the issues that Cecily brought up is it, primarily mortalities. How can we try to reduce mortalities through education and outreach uh, in our subcommittee or in our ecosystems? And so uh, having more people on that subcommittee makes it, I think, a better effort. So that's my my plea and, and, and sales pitch for getting more people from all the different agencies and uh, groups on there. Uh, to kind of really segue off of what Cecily talked about, <coughs> excuse me, one of the primary uh, for the CEO subcommittee for the IGBC have, have, has focused on, thanks to Lori Roberts, who's really spearheaded this, this effort, is the Bear Smart Community Program. And that's really looking at addressing what Cecily just pointed out as a huge issue, which is improper food storage. It's just a constant perennial issue that we're dealing with and it's leading to mortalities. And so uh, one way this is through this program that's still in the works. It's the Bear Smart Community Program that will essentially really try to help communities uh, country uh, come up with ways that they make their community, uh, you know, proper food storage is a big one. Uh, uh, community plans that they would work with bear managers uh, on to help identify issues in their leading to conflicts with bears, uh, mortalities with bears. Um, and so Lori and other on the, the other chairs of the IEO subcommittees, as well as uh, Kim Johnston, have really worked hard. I mean, I can't remember how many meetings we've had in the last six months by like dozens and and Lori is just really championing this program we'll present to the IGBC executive committee uh, this year uh, with a little bit more of a fine-tuned product that we would uh, hopefully uh, get out there and basically just to give these communities toolkits and and ways so that they're not having to just start from scratch without the expertise that a lot of our cities and counties don't have and just basically on a, on a hopefully on a silver platter give them the tools and resources and assistance they need to address um, these issues. I mean, it's it's happened organically, actually just right up the road in Whitefish. And I really want to give Whitefish, the city of Whitefish, kudos. And, and in many ways, they're almost the, the model that we're hoping to uh, perpetuate across bear country. And, and that's uh, recently, uh, they passed the city ordinance that is requiring all city uh, garbage cans be bear resistant containers. And so they are through a uh, $6 a month increase to their garbage uh, fee, going to give almost 4,000 bear resistant uh, containers to all city residents. 
And, and that's, I think, that's a huge, uh, obviously a huge part of what the Bear Smart Community Program would help to uh, increase awareness and support for. But to see the city of Whitefish really lead the way on their own has been has been great. Uh, our Fish, Wildlife, and Parks staff, particularly Eric Wedham and Justine Balliers, have, have really worked with the city to increase their awareness. Last summer, uh, they had 19 different black bears roaming through town, and that really was leading to daily uh, issues and conflicts. We also have grizzly bears that are going through town in Whitefish too. So uh, it was it was um, you know kudos to the city. And the residents who saw the need to address it and they jumped on it and uh, they just about two weeks ago passed that city ordinance and so uh, would love to to give whitefish all the credit for for taking the reins and being proactive on that front for that and hoping that now uh, they can also be a model in our bear smart community program to show other communities that you can do this there's there's things you can do uh, and uh, help that we can provide to address those issues so um, that is kind of the primary, I'll try to keep us on track here, but that's kind of the primary two things I wanted to mention. Uh, other than you can just see the, you know, with spring's arrival, we're unloading swag, is, uh, informational materials and resources across the region as best we can. Mm -hmm. If any agencies would like uh, digital copies of postcards like this one, please let me know and we'll, we'll help you from Fish, Wildlife, and Park, Parks perspective. Uh, we've got signage that we've created uh, in previous years with the IEO subcommittee uh, about, you know, fast paced recreation on our trails to increase awareness for bikers and hikers. Uh, food storage has become a, a kind of the priority as Cecily's presentation showed that that's an issue that we need to really, I think, address head on. And so everything from bear fairs uh, that our bear specials are doing and that other agency groups are doing, uh, that's a huge one. Uh, Educational videos, we're trying to get more of those out on social media and then shared on places like the IGBC website. Uh, and then handouts that go to uh, homeowner associations, sporting stores, uh, distributed any way and every way we can. I mean, we're, we're trying to really get these out as much as we can. And so if you have a need for resources like this, please let me know and we can work with you to, to try to get you those. Uh, as well as inert bear spray I put out, if you, and your bear rangers uh, or other staff have needs for inert bear spray. Uh, Lori, through the IGBC grant process, was able to get uh, each of these ecosystems a ton of inert bear spray that are really effective educational tools. Uh, we, that's, I think, uh, become a big attractive for our bear fairs. People show up because they just want to spray uh, the inert bear spray. And it's a really, you can see it's it's kind of a light bulb moment for folks. They, they hear about bear spray and they know a little bit about it, but once they actually Hold it, take the safety off and spray it. You can kind of see a, a good uh, light bulb reaction there. So uh, if you or your staff have needs for that, please let me know as well. And we'll try to get you what we can. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I'll stop there. Other than to say a reminder that David Diamond, the IGBC coordinator, is asking that we, uh, everyone who wants to receive updates about IGBC related news, including meetings, to sign up on the IGBC website. This is gonna hopefully create consistency across the IGBC on how you receive notices. Subcommittee members will still receive meeting and announcements, save the dates from the chair, whoever that may be, um, but members of the public or other staff who wanna keep up on uh, when these meetings are, any other announcements from IGBC, it's all coming from a centralized uh, sign up on the IGBC website. So that way it'll avoid you know, me or anyone else who, who just has kind of an informal list of email addresses uh, from missing people. So we don't want to have that happen. Uh, so please, if you want to receive any future announcements from IGBC, go to the IGBC online website. And it's a real simple right there. It says sign up for the IGBC newsletter. So uh, and yeah. Dale, as I remember, I think this was our last meeting that we're going to do that informal yes. push. So again, uh, all members of the public, please uh, go into that IGBC. That will be our new way of getting the information out. Uh, we did try to transition this this last meeting for sending that informal aspect, but uh, we are going to be going through that that formal IGBC. So if you're interested, please make sure you're signed up there. Thanks, Kurt. Yeah, that's all I got. Any um, questions? Well, on the subcommittee uh, that you were talking about earlier, did you? If you want to just have them contact you directly. Yeah, please, please do. If you have uh, you or someone you you know might be interested, just have them reach out to me, and I will 
uh, not going to drill them with the interview process. I'll just say, <laughs> yes, please take them. <laughs> so uh, not a very rigorous application. So uh, anybody who's interested in this, that's all I need. To, that's all I need is confirmation. As long as they have a pulse and an interest in addressing <laughs> education yeah. outreach, I'll, I'll take them. <clears throat> Thank you, Dylan. Any questions uh, for Dylan from the subcommittee? Any online? All right, nice job, Dylan. Thank you. Next up, Hillary talking about uh, grizzly bear conflict response. Yeah, right. thanks, Kurt. Um, I just wanted to give an update on um, a few things related to conflict. One of the biggest things is um, I think everybody, pretty sure at the fall meeting, I gave an update. Um, there is a new law in Montana that went into effect March 1st, Senate Bill 337, that, and it says a couple things. Um, FWP staff cannot relocate conflict bears if they're in conflict inside the recovery zone. That's one of the major pieces of it. So what that means for us is that we have to do relocations now in those areas. Um, that any, for any bear that meets a conflict, you know, the definition of a conflict. Um, and so we've developed an MOA with the with FWP that kind of goes into a lot of detail for who's going to do what, the roles and responsibilities so that everybody's clear in what cases. You know, FWP can they can they can go out and trap, they can handle a bear, put it back in a trap. We will come and pick it up and then move it. And so it's when you start thinking about it it's a pretty big it's a pretty uh, complicated process that we're trying to work through so we have this moa um and we're hiring staff um actually on monday we have a couple staff that will start two people will be in montana one person will be in wyoming there's not a law there but there's a situation and they've asked us to respond then we'll have a rover person who can go we might need to help in Idaho, they can be available. Um, one of them is here, <laughs> Amber Cornett. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's not I just wanted to introduce Amber. She's she's not on board yet. She starts uh, Monday. So she decided to come. Um, and so you'll hear a lot more from Amber. And the other people are starting um, a couple next week, and then the other ones hopefully in early June. And it's a background check. It just takes a while. So um, yeah, I wanted to let people know that. Um, there's a lot of work that we've been doing, especially Jennifer. Um, Amber's been helping a little bit too in terms of working with the forests on relocation sites. And so, you know, I, with the Flathead, um, Helena Lewis Clark is a number of forests where this is kind of a normal thing, but it's been the state that's done it. And so we are working with them to make sure we know, you know, we agree on sites that we can use to um, come up with contact lists. Who are we going to contact now and a, a communication plan? Um, and then we're also talking to forests that don't typically do relocation. So um, if you remember in 2018, we have that fair in Stevensville. And we didn't have a relocation site down there. We didn't have anything in the Bitterroot or the Lolo and so, or the Beaverhead Deer Lodge. And so that's a huge deal for us too. We're not, we're trying to be really slow about it. We don't want people thinking we're reintroducing bears into new areas. That's not what we're doing at all. But if we have a bear that's an incidental catch or maybe it's a minor conflict, we would like to be able to relocate it somewhere nearby rather than moving it back north, north of 90. Um, and so, but we're aware it's new for people and we don't want to do anything that could reduce tolerance. So um, that's been a that's been a big process. It's still ongoing. <laughs> and um, so far this year, we have had a lot of conflicts. Uh, most of them are on the, have been on the Blackfeet Indian Reservation. So we haven't had to relocate any bears we might tomorrow, though. <laughs> There's a new conflict in Columbia Falls, and it could be. I was just talking to Justine. Um, so, um, yeah, just be aware of that. It's a new thing for us. Um, but 
we're going to have some staff and relocations are not going to take up 100% of their time. So most of their time will be um, prevention, uh, education. So Dylan, I can volunteer two people for the subcommittee. <laughs> um, and we've been talking with Lori a little bit about Bear Smart. Maybe these folks could be helpful in the Bear Smart program. Um, and if other, I was talking with Danielle Oriler, when we get people on board, we want to make sure we're coordinating really well and not causing, not duplicating efforts, not causing extra problems. And so um, I want to know from people how things are working or if we should do things different, how we can help in general. Um, so, yeah, I think that was, that's pretty much the conflict update. Any questions for Hillary? And then we're going to transition to the HIP update. But any questions for Hillary before we do that? You know, my Hillary, I really appreciate it. I know this is the first year of, of uh, Fish and Wildlife Service kind of taking over this, but from what I've gathered, at least for the Pinehead folks, I think that communication bridge is, is happening and it will continue to uh, get better as we move forward. So. Yeah, it'll be a little bit clunky maybe to start as we figure it out, but we'll we'll quickly get it there. Awesome. Thanks. You want to introduce the next topic too, Hillary? Sure, Carrie. Um, well, Carrie, you're yeah. probably better to introduce <laughs> this. Yeah, Carrie, yeah. This up. I'm hoping to pull up here. Um, then I just have a few couple of really quick slides just to help kind of visualize what we're talking about. Um, but uh, just to kind of get started, so again, it was the Tribal Wildlife Management Program and some community reservation. Uh, and so, <coughs> um, so last year, Peyton and I, um, we did a, dealt with a lot of the grizzly bear conflicts on the reservation, and there was a couple of times where you know we'd be working with folks. There was a particular instance where we're working, we're on the phone with somebody that had you know multiple trees you know open uh, unsecured they had their garbage unsecured it was a venue that also had weddings but they didn't secure wedding garbage um attractive so yeah this is perfect here thank you um and so i was on the phone with the gal and we were talking about some ways that we could potentially help they were uninterested in electric fences they were uninterested in securing their garbage they also have some homes. Uh, they live in an area. Their property borders Mission Creek, which is a really high corridor. Oh, thank you so much for um, particularly black bears, but also grizzly bears. I will occasionally use this corridor. Mission Creek goes right over, um, right through one of our under, wildlife underpasses. It's an expansion bridge that was put in in the highway reconstruction project. And so with that, you know, we're trying to increase. Um, uh, use of those structures by putting some um, highway um, wildlife fencing around the highway there to help kind of promote use of these structures by bears and other um, wildlife species. And so, you know, we're working with this person and they, um, you know, don't want anything but bear traps and moose. And, you know, we're trying to get through the point that there is a corridor that bears are moving through removing one bear isn't going to make an issue or isn't going to make an impact if there's still garbage there's still um you know uh um orchards apples all of that still available but they weren't receptive to helping find a solution to the problem and then um so after that call we're driving along the highway right by this person's property and across the so their property budded right up against Mission Creek. And then on the other side of the creek, we noticed that there's a bunch of fence posts, probably about eight of them, kind of posted or um, put in the ground along Mission Creek with some garbage cans kind of nailed to them, and then some um, fire rings. And so, you know, we're looking up kind of through Onyx land status, and turned out it was the same gal we were talking to on the other side of the creek about the orchard and unsecured trash. Um, they also own a hip camp. 
and I wasn't sure what a hip cap was at the time, but um, we were able to kind of look online and find that um, there are quite a few hip camps um, already in the Mission Valley. And so um, what hip camps are is if you've got private property, um, you can advertise or you know use hip camp as a way to rent it out to campers. Um, and it's kind of like Airbnb, but for camping. So if I have, you know, a couple extra acres and I want to make some money off of that, I can offer it up for hip camp and folks traveling through can come and camp there. And so there, <laughs> this is something, I don't know how relatively new it is. I think it's been around um, for a while, but it's the first that we've kind of um, had it uh, come up in a conflict. And so, um, just to kind of give a bigger scope or a picture of where some of these hip camps are, um, this is kind of around Glacier. And just note that, like, if you zoom in, like, more will pop up. So the further you zoom in, the more of these that pop up. But then around Yellowstone, this one there were a lot once you started zooming in. And then there are even some out on the eastern front there as well. And so hip camps are um, kind of, they're all throughout Montana. And they're, um, you know, up to the discretion of the private landowner, what they do as far as garbage security and um, just bare, general bear safety or awareness. And so folks that are coming through and renting this hip camp right next to Mission Creek, you know, may not even be knowing that there um, are bears or other things to be wary of. So this is just that hip camp advertisement for this place. And here's just some pictures that have been posted by people using the camp. So this is one of the sites that posts um, in a different picture. You can see where they have garbage cans just kind of wrapped to or around those posts. There's Mission Creek. And this is somebody's camp. Um, and then right outside, I had to cut it off, but there's an open cooler. Um, and then, you know, just like right along the creek, folks camping right there. And the reason we brought this up too today was that, or this is also a unique spot because it is right off of Highway 93. You can see it from the highway, but also, um, and I think uh, Joe was going to speak a bit more to this portion of it, but we've been working with MBT and again, um, increasing the effectiveness of these wildlife crossing structures, which also means more wildlife friendly fencing. And now with this hip camp being here, right, butting up against that crossing structure, we've had to amend um, our plans in this area, even though, you know, we're kind of ready to get on the ground to get some fences up. Now we can't put fences in this area because we don't want to be, you know, preventing bears from moving through there that are using right next to a campground. And so this is definitely something we wanted to just kind of present and bring up to the group as, as far as um, food security and storage and just general bear awareness of folks who might be utilizing and camping in these areas that don't realize, oh, the that was yet to show you where the fence was, but <laughs> that we're, we're hoping to put in. Yeah, I don't know if Joe had any other things to kind of follow up well on that. But yeah, this is kind of just something we thought we'd want to bring to everyone's attention, maybe just brainstorm um, and have some conversations about how to maybe raise awareness or um, prevent some potential conflicts with people camping in some of these areas. So we have some time for. Okay, is it okay if I just step in and. I, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, Carrie presented it really well. We were right at the tail end of a, uh, of a project, MDT project along the three right here, where we are trying to uh, connect uh, all of the crossing structures that are currently in place. And we're, we're extending fence to get wildlife, white tail deer and grizzly bears to, to more um effectively use those crossing structures and, and more frequently use those crossing structures that are already there um, and this is both north and south of saint ignatius so 
we are close to letting the project for contract and here right at the tail end of project development um, we discover something happening on the adjacent private land that really put a uh, a wrench into finalizing those plans and getting the uh, project out because you know we really don't want to put an eight foot fence up right along this hip camp site and then and then those any bears that might happen to skirt around the site, um, they're basically forced to stay there, you know, within the campsite until they disperse either through town or to the north or, or to the south, I mean, or or back again to the east. So MDT had to react really quickly to get this section of fence removed from the, uh, the construction plans so that um, you know, we're not uh, creating a, a worsened conflict situation. So um, yeah, th this was very eye opening experience where we're accustomed to looking for um, developments, uh, subdivision development uh, along our highway projects where we're trying to do wildlife accommodations. Um, but this is something new that now we keep an eye out on. Uh, just to make sure that we don't create a conflict situation or or make a, a potential situation a lot worse by suddenly, um, you know, blocking animals and, and keeping them in an area that we really don't want them to stay. Well said, Joe. Any thoughts? Seems like an education type opportunity there, Dylan. We're we're kind of on the so the IGBC the our subcommittee has been really um, also focusing on BRBO and Airbnb because we're having the same issue with people are coming in they're not having any contact potentially with any kind of information about what they're encountering and so um, just part of the discussion is how to uh, insert into their protocols their safety you know can we give them a magnet to put up at their in their kitchen do you know somehow we need to let the owners that live in these bare areas um have some kind of education and then potentially hopefully like a bear resistant container and have I, you know so i just i just want to let you know that we are trying to talk about it but trying to get to the head of these things i've sent an email and it went nowhere just randomly seeing if i could get a response to who would call me back and or Talk to an email. So to Airbnb. The Airbnb. Yeah, I was just like, hey, I'm the <laughs> education, you know, chair for this big group. Uh, but you know, I, I think it'll take. It'll probably take more priding. I just, it's yeah. So I just want to say that not only this hip camp, but also we should talk about VRBO and Airbnb because you're kind of, you're not running into people that are, are along a stream, but you're also running into people where their education is missing, so they're not, or they're not getting their factors. Um, the Ovando human fatality last year, we're finalizing that board of review and we'll present recommendations at the summer IGBC meeting. Um, so I think part of the recommendations are camping on private land. I mean, so the that scenario, if, no, if people are not familiar with it, they were, they were camping on private land. It was right in right in the community center. So you would not expect a bear to be there, let alone a bear attack a human, but um, they had food in the tent and right next to the tent. And so, uh, you know, not only is this a conservation issue, but it's a human safety issue, a huge one. And um, so, you know, I think it's worth discussion at the summer meeting, but maybe now and continue discussion maybe with some working groups on how to forcefully and consistently send that message around. So it's you know, even if people are not interested in bear conservation, they might be take the human safety part seriously. And how to get that out to these private places, you know, it's like, what about billboards? Could, you know, you're in grizzly bear habitat. How, how else can we do the messaging and let people know what's going on? Go ahead, Katie. Looks, it looks like hip camp provides insurance coverage for the people who use their site. I wonder if there's a way to approach it through, like mm -hmm. in, in order to be covered by our insurance policy, you have to comply with these basic fair safety yeah. principles. And they, it also looks like they 
advise people at the time of booking what the requirements are for like waste disposal and stuff. So maybe there's a way if we could get a contact there. Well, that's what I'm hoping for. Because if you look, so we recently had a VRBO happen in our neighborhood, and they have to, there's certain things you have to meet to be yeah, like a VRBO. Yeah, you have to like, the neighborhood has to be notified. Are there any grievances just in your neighborhood about being a VRBO? And that's how in our neighborhood it, it happened. And I was like, no, oh, they, you know, so you really have to step through some some hoops. And so if you land and if we put up, if we let, you know, I was hoping if we let the owners of VRBO know, like in this area, can you have some other regulations that people sign up? Yeah. Um, that would be helpful. It's just, you know, I know Tim and Tim maybe can speak a little bit too, like talking like a big part of um, what he was working on was talking to real estate agencies about letting people know that you're buying in bear country. And I mean, to, you know, how long did you work on that? It just, they don't, it's like they don't want to let people know. They, they, it might scare them away, which we're not scaring anyone away from moving to the Lycos <laughs> Valley right now. With, you know, there's a grizzly bear, you know. I mean, you know. So, um, yeah, it, it's going to take some, yeah. We've been trying to brainstorm about it. And and um, right now, like Daniel Euler, who's our, our uh, Yellowstone subcommittee chair, is working on like a, a poster to, for people to put into these VRBOs, but then you have to go around and know who, I don't know how we would distribute it. So I think let's go straight to the source and say, guess what folks, you're going to have to jump through one more hoop and make it bear smart. I mean, and just, you know, I would love to just ixnay it at the source <laughs> in my mind, but I might not be the right person to do that. I mean, you know, a little, you might be curious about that. <laughs> we have other things to do. I think. You know, but if we could get like the IGBC executive committee to write a letter or to start making that, you know, our next chair is Ed from Idaho. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Ed sent him, you know, a, a message or something. Just, but, I'll just make a quick comment. It's not grizzly bear, but Rachel, who manly, who's my wife, worked for the Forest Service and she was a wildlife technician in the North Spot here. She was overseeing loon nests like on Spoon Lake, and there's a lot of Airbnbs along Spoon Lake, yeah. and she actually contacted and wrote letters or called each of the Airbnbs along there and stressed the importance of not disturbing the loon nest. Right? And she got a lot of good compliance with that. And so I think you're right, Lori, it's going to take a lot of effort, but if you can contact those Airbnbs and BNBOs, we did that in the North Pole too with grizzly bear stuff, make them aware of the fact that people staying there need to use, you know, there is just a garbage can, don't leave garbage sitting out on the porch, that kind of stuff. So it's you're gonna have to go to the Airbnbs or the DRBOs or the hip camps that you're really concerned about, I think, in contact. Can I interject something just so, from personal experience? So real quick, we're gonna have so I, I do want to keep us on track and I really wanna hear what you but sure, we, no as soon as I open up the no, I'll just tell her about it. All right, thank you. Um, I don't mean to be a stickler, but uh, it is a really important topic, and I think it's it's prudent. But if we can keep to the subcommittee, that would be helpful. Um, I think we have a lot of ideas around this, so members of the public, by all means, if you want to reach out, Lori, I'm sure you're uh, willing. <laughs> but uh, we'll we'll continue to move forward. So, any other subcommittee members have any thoughts on this? Well, I guess I'm wondering if we do we need a working do we need a few people to think more about this or do we just ask the I don't know if there's capacity with the IME subcommittee to do something more or um I think it should get moved up to the executives to tell you the truth okay yeah because it affects all it's the entire stuff. yeah okay so I can bring I, I was I was thinking about putting it in my PowerPoint this uh, for this summer. Yeah. Kurt, you know, can bring it up too. Okay. Know, but one of us, we can, I can talk with Kurt, and one of us could bring it up. Um, but I, I think it's an issue that should be pushed forward. I was going to talk to David at our next advisory meeting. Yeah, okay. it's probably a good thing to bring up. They're doing a field trip, and I think this could be a part of that. We could look up and see the hip camps in yeah. that, that are in that That's area true. where we're going to be. Yeah. So, it's and all the VRBOs and all the Airbnbs. I mean. Yeah. Sandpoint has a bajillion Airbnbs to that. Yeah. We're going there as a family. So, <laughs> Gary, Gary, you have a comment? Go ahead. And then we got to move on in about two minutes. Yeah, just a quick comment. I mean, uh, we're seeing it everywhere. It, mm -hmm. it isn't just in the NCD, it's in the 
Uh, Yellowstone, I suspect it's in the act. I, you know, I'm wondering if there's a concerted effort here to address this new influx of people that really don't understand grizzly bear conservation, don't understand grizzly bear conflict, and they're they're actually increasing the potential for um, a whole new surge in conflict conflict uh, related to human human activity and human safety. And I think we should look at it from the perspective of all the recovery areas. Yeah, well said, Gary. So I think uh, between Laura and I, we'll try to bring that up to the IGBC and maybe try to get it on their agenda topic to see if we want to do a subcommittee, Hillary, um, at the bigger scale yeah. with some of these national tech groups. Yeah, and luckily great. VRBO was bought by Homeboy, so maybe we only need to contact one person with that realm. Same company. Huh? Same company. Same company. Yeah, they bought the Homeway bought the RBO, which Homeway is Airbnb. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks for that, Hillary. And Homeway lost her name. Carrie, thank you. Uh, appreciate that topic. I think it's a very important one and one that could have yeah. dramatic uh, impacts as we move forward. So we're going to transition again. Um, we're going to go to Rich Harris, and Dylan's got some handouts for Rich, and this will be on the Montana Genetic uh, Program. Augmentation Program. Do you, do you want me to be here? So Absolutely. Is that, is that one for you? Can do that. Um, Dylan's handing out some documentation. I will resist the temptation to have a little fun with the uh, title that I've been given here. I don't know whether Montana itself requires any genetic augmentation. Rich, if you don't mind just introducing yourself. Sorry, <laughs> Rich Harris, Fifth Wildlife and Parks. Um, the reason it's called the Montana Genetic Augmentation Program is, the, I guess, is because this is an initiative that is at the moment coming from Montana Fish Wildlife Parks. But it is by no means new. It's been sitting around the grizzly bear world for um, about as long as I've been involved with grizzly bears because previous Grizzly Bear Recovery Coordinator asked me to put together a meeting with geneticists at which this kind of thing came up, and that was in 1985. So it's been around for quite a while, but recently Montana Fish Wildlife Parks decided to suggest an initiative to move forward with actually putting this on the ground. Um, it has to do with the Yellowstone system. They're the, they're the bears that are in need of some long-term genetic augmentation, not the bears from the NCDP. But the bears who would form the immigrants, the migrants, would likely come from the NCD. So this initiative has um, been introduced to the executive committee at their virtual meeting in Spokane. Um, no action, no particular action was taken that I'm aware of. It was then presented to the YES committee at their meeting in Jackson and introduced to the concept and these, this documentation was, I think, presented not quite sure that any action occurred there either. Um, <laughs> now I'm presenting it here. Um, what this is, uh, uh, just a brief, a, a brief overview of what's going on here. There are two documents. Um, one I've labeled the uh, considerations and preliminary step down, and that's kind of the, the what and why um, of genetic augmentation of bears to get rid of Yellowstone. The other document is called the rational, uh, no, I'm sorry, the rationale process. I got the mixed up. The rationale process document is the what and why. And the step down is the how, when, and who. Um, to, I will very briefly give you the sort of takeaway points of these documents because they're more than two pages long. So people might not read them. The, um, the, what, the, the what and the why, um, we've known for your, decades that the Greater Yellowstone population is isolated from other grizzly bear populations. That has remained the case. Um, what we know better than we used to know back in 85 is that that population, of course, is doing very well. It has increased in size and the genetic diversity has also increased. So that what we what geneticists refer to as the genetically effective population size is actually larger than we estimated it would have been decades ago. Um, so that means that there's not any kind of a short-term emergency. There's no inbreeding, or very, very little inbreeding. Um, the, the, 
So that is just talk in terms of, of a short term and a long term genetic concerns. And along with those go some rules of thumb that have been around for decades of the number of genetically affected animals you need in a population, the, the small number being 50, the large number being 500. The, the concerns associated with the short term uh, genetic issues in Yellowstone have gone away. The long term concerns of the plasticity of that population, the, the ability of those bears to have the genetic tools as a population to cope with possible future change remains an issue. And that is the reason we consider we, we talk about connectivity all the time. And that's why connectivity is a major theme in Montana's plans. It's a major theme in the two conservation strategies as well. Um, natural connectivity is in those plans. It has not occurred as of yet. Another way that connectivity can be achieved is by moving an occasional bear to the Yellowstone system. The other takeaway I guess I would I would leave you with if you can remember nothing else from the rationale document is how many bears are we talking about? How big of a deal is this? Um, none of this, of course, is known in advance when we're dealing with moving bears or capturing bears. Not, none of it can be preordained and made exactly the way you want it to be, but we're talking on the order of two or three bears per decade. We're not talking about a huge issue or a huge influx of bears. That the, the science, the, 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 the theory, and all we know empirically tells us that that number of bears will do it, will suffice if continued long term, essentially indefinitely, to connect those populations genetically in the way that we think ultimately is the, the correct management strategy. The, um, the next part is this, the, the who, how, and where, and that part is the part that um, a number of people in this room have contributed to. This is, I've, I'm the coordinator of this, and I've done the writing, but it is by no means all my intellectual work. It reflects the input of the bear biologists, the bear managers from both systems. Most of them are listed on this. Um, and the, the bottom line on that is that the recipient landowners in the Yellowstone system are not willing to take a problem bear. They're also not willing to take a bear that might be a problem. So that if the thought was, oh, well, you know, Cecily had a graph earlier that showed some of these bears that were um, not the one that was intended to be captured. It appeared to be an innocent bystander in a conflict situation, but as far as we knew, not involved in conflict itself. That bear would not be um, acceptable to the landowners in the, in the Yellowstone system. So it would have to be a, 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 a program much more similar to what Tim has been doing over the years with the cabinets, where it's a it's a specific effort to capture a bear that, as far as anyone can figure, is free of conflict. That would be the only kinds of bears that would be acceptable to people in Yellowstone. Um, another takeaway is that um, this is not an attempt to increase the size of the Yellowstone grizzly population. It is, a, it is simply a matter of, of in allowing what geneticists refer to as alleles. You can think of it as the genetic uh, perhaps recipe that different bears have to allow some of that to be also in the Yellowstone system, because right now the Yellowstone bears have a lower level of genetic diversity than other bears in the system. Um, and I guess the last part would be what kind of bear the, the committee that the group that we informally circulated and had some Zoom meetings talked about. There, there were no absolute, no, no way, no how, any particular kinds of uh, sex or age of bear. That said, um, I think there's a consensus that a, um, a female on the young side, older than a yearling or two, but not quite adult, would probably be the most appropriate bear. So this. This document has a lot of recommendations regarding what is most likely to be a bear that will stay in the Yellowstone system, survive and reproduce, because after all, we're talking about genetics, so it does no good for the bear to go there if, and even live its whole life there if it doesn't interbreed with bears that are there, but equally importantly, not become a conflict bear and then potentially bugger the whole system by having uh, negative reactions to it. Um, I think we, the, the group working on this has essentially taken these documents as, as far as we can at this point, but what we don't really have is buy-in from the agencies. A lot of agency folks have seen these and I've not heard any particular negative reaction, but the proposal at this point is that this transition from being a Fish and Parks led effort to being a IGBC effort because lots of different groups are involved with getting this through. One thing I did forget to mention, 
while I was tasked with leading this effort to put the expertise together, resulting in these documents, the three states, the wildlife agencies of the three states, Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho, had a um, meeting in which they formalized a new three-state, tri-state MOA, or is it an MOU, an understanding agreement that mostly deals with um, how mortality would be allocated in the Yellowstone system should delisting happen in Yellowstone. But in there is also a commitment of the three states to move forward with this plan. But there are no details. There, you know, all of that was kind of left to folks but such as I organized. So um, I think it's important that the guidance be out there so that people understand what we're talking about. Um, I think it's appropriate for this to become a public document. So members of the public who have concerns or suggestions have a chance to weigh in. And, uh, and it seems to me the way that we would do that is by having these documents form part of the conservation strategies of both the Yellowstone and NCDE. Um, exactly how that would work out, I, I don't know. But I guess my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kurt or or whoever, is um, if there's going to be an addition or a supplement or a revision to the conservation plan that that specified strategy, that becomes a, an opportunity for the public to weigh in. Or it's happening, right? So, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm uncomfortable with this at this point being something that the public doesn't have a chance to see. It's been floating around on agency computers for some time now. And um, I don't think there's anything nefarious or difficult. And obviously, I think it's a, a good piece of work. So I don't think there's anything wrong with it. But um, I do think it's time for the public to be aware of it and so that we can move forward with clear understanding and, and thorough consideration of the pros and cons. So I'm, I'm asking Kurt, <laughs> my suggestion is that the folks in, on the NCD now become a bit more active and rather than passive and say, perhaps up the chain to the executive committee and say, let's let's work on formalizing these. And in that process, revise anything that needs to be revised in this in this group. Yeah, I, I will say two things. First, I think we can post this on the IGBC website accordingly because we just had a uh, discussion about it. So I think we can post these two documents on that to make them more aware of public information. Um, the other aspect I don't know about the uh, supplement and how that works uh, because I wasn't here when the conservation strategy was done. I don't know uh, how much involvement that really entailed, but I do think it's worth bringing up to IGBC and I can carry that message forward. Gary, I don't know, being the co-chair, if you have any uh, thoughts on that as well. Hopefully I don't just hit you, hit you uh, blind. Might be out. Hillary, you have any thoughts on that? On which part, Kurt? Well, so again, I think uh, Rich is asking, how do we bring this forward uh, to get that on IGBC? Again, I'll, I'll carry it forward as a message. We can post it on the IGBC website. He mentioned in terms of uh, if we do any kind of supplemental um, in terms of the conservation strategy, this might be a time to, to think about it then. Um, I'll, I'll say in general, from what I've talked to uh, with the conservation strategy, it's, it's we're still in the early formation of it. So uh, whether we open up that and, and and actually go through a full revision process again, it took us a lot to get to where we, we have today. And I think we're in a, a really good spot given all the work that's went into it. So. Well, we'll be talking about the strategy next and maybe changes or not. Yeah. But you know, I don't think there's a formal process for IBBC for like other documents like this. So, so it's something we should probably have a discussion about with IGBC. And both subcommittees should be aware of it. And he presented that. Did you say Jackson? No, okay. um, Lori, I'm just going to Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. So it has been presented to both subcommittees. It has. And, and, then, and then separately, um, it was also presented in a, in a separate meeting to the or supervisors of the Yellowstone system. So, because presum they're, they're presumably a bear that's going to make the trip, make the trip, yep. is going to go either to Yellowstone Park or to one of the Forest Service right. jurisdictions in the Yellowstone. Conceivably, it could go to a state land, but most likely the 
places we're talking about are, are mostly remote sites, so they need to be on board, and so they're also aware of it. And, and the other thing I should add is that um, there's really nothing terribly new in here, in the sense that when we move bears around, there's always got to be coordination between state agency, in some cases, it'll, it'll be the, the service, and the land managers, forest service, and the people are not dumping bears in forest service lands on where the forest service is unaware. That would simply continue to be the case. Um, nothing really new there. No, maybe the only thing, make sure people are aware, if we were, we take a bear from here, whether it's moving it to Yak or moving it to Yellowstone, it's counted as a mortality to this ecosystem. Right. I mean, it's only two or three every 10 decades or 10 years, <laughs> but people should be aware of that. You know, if we start contributing bears to many different efforts at some point, you know, we're getting up there in terms of, you know, removals. Dylan, I see you lean forward. Well, I'm just I mean, body lamp, so. yeah. <laughs> the nice thing about being in person. Yeah. <laughs> I and mean, I'm just trying to remember, Rich, just because I've been, you and I have both been through the NCD conservation strategy. And I, it does say in general terms, doesn't it, about genetic augmentation can and could occur. So I think the conservation strategy in general terms does allow that, allow that and, and promote that as a, as a possible tool in the toolbox. So just throw that out there as I'm trying to rack my brain on hours and hours of reading that document. And Dylan, don't we have a process of amendment? I mean, I thought, I thought we do Randy have a process Arnold. of amendment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So there's things that are grammatical, you know, Randy Arnold, when he was chair, kind of lined that out. Uh, grammatical uh, corrections just occur. And then I have a sheet online that accompanies the conservation strategy that shows yeah, the I, editing. So just to throw that out there. I, I don't think this is a, a, a matter of new policy. But some of the detailed stuff in here seems to me useful to have with some formality so that folks can look at that and say, well, this is some, a document a number of folks who know about these things have worked on that gives us guidance as to the, the who, what, where, when, how, since it'll be a, kind of a long-term thing that people will have questions about. Yeah. And so I'm trying to think when we updated, for example, the some things that were beyond grammatical I think the process this committee agreed on was to present it to the committee, have them weigh in yay or nay, and then it would be added supplementally just as a appendix or a, an update that would be reflected in that document that shows changes from when the conservation strategy was approved four years ago or three years ago. So I think, if I remember, and Randy Arnold, if you're on, if you you were the one who, this was kind of one of your brain children, so you help me out here. <laughs> Yeah, you described that well, Dylan. I, there would just be a process where if if um, Rich just wanted to get that to you, Dylan, you could submit it to the to the board or the committee and just have them review it. If you have a recommendation that it's just an edit, you can just make that decision. This sounds this seems to me a little more substantive than that. I, and I I can't I don't want to hazard a guess as to whether or not there just be comfort in including it as an addendum or an attachment. Um, it, it's informational. So, so I guess this time, Rich, I don't think we're willing to make a decision on that. But again, I think there's some more conversation that needs to occur. Is, is what I'll say. And then again, I'll kick it up to IPBC to to allow them to whether they put on the agenda or not for a topic. Okay. Any? Other, I do have a question for you, just as a curiosity after that. So you mentioned Yellowstone has less genetic diversity. Got a theory on that? I'm just, that was news to me. I thought that was interesting. <clears throat> um, do you want to, you might know, might be better. Well, um, their isolation goes back, you know, at a least 100 time. years, gotcha. um, possibly more. And so, and uh, the evidence doesn't indicate that they went through a bottleneck um, even in the 20s when populations were probably um, quite low. Um, but I think it's just generally the isolation that is the cause of it. Um, the, the NCDE is part of a larger, um, more connected set of um, populations. Um, and so that's the main difference. Just the isolation. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. If, if I could add one more technical. Absolutely. You got 10 more minutes. <laughs> it's not going to take 10. Um, 
the notion here is is a connectivity, but it's not necessarily one of making all the bears completely identical, right? Because there is, I don't think this is a known, but the, well, in this situation where the where the, there's been as much um, time of isolation as, as there has been, there's the potential that there could be adaptive differences that you don't want to swap. And so this level of connectivity is considered to be the level that would allow the Yellowstone bears to have the genetic diversity they, they would need without forcing them to become NCT bears if they don't want to be, if that makes any sense. I'm obviously anthropomorphizing the, the yeah. genetics. Absolutely. I haven't found too many uh, disagreements that genetic diversity is a positive thing. So, Any other questions from the subcommittee? Before we let Rich? Right into the sunset. Right. <laughs> thank, thank you for sharing. We appreciate it. All right, we're going to head a schedule, which is abnormal. Um, we're going to transition to Scott and David uh, to talk about the conservation strategy. All right, David, if you guys can both introduce yourself to make sure folks know who you are. Go ahead, David. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is David Diamond. I'm the executive coordinator of the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee. I'm very sorry I can't be there in person today. Had a pre-existing commitment. Um, thrilled to be able to participate in this way. And uh, I think part of the agenda time, I'm hoping to get a, have a little bit of time left over to give you some updates from the IGBC perspective. But Scott, go ahead. Good morning. Yeah, I'm Scott Jackson with the U.S. Forest Service, the National Carnival Program lead uh, based out of the regional office in Missoula. And um, I do understand there's other folks that have uh, pieces and parts to contribute to this topic. So, um, you know, this this topic was on the draft agenda. Um, I wanted to follow up on something that uh, an assignment I had from this subcommittee last year. And so, um, so put my name onto the agenda topic. Um, I think that works well, but I know there's others that have pieces for it too. So, and in this tears off and segues well from Rich's talk and the conversation we were just having about the strategy. So um, briefly, I just wanted to, uh, like I said, follow up on um, an assignment from last spring's NCDE subcommittee meeting. Uh, Chairman Arnold asked that, um, you know, I pulled together Folks from the um, the conservation strategy team that was that uh, was assembled um, in 2017 and 18 when we uh, finalized the conservation strategy, and just try to uh, see uh, you know touch base with those folks to um, to get a sense of how the conservation strategy is you know is it working is it is it um, you know given that it was developed with uh, uh, with a post delisting um, you know management plan uh, kind of concept, you know, now that uh, we haven't gotten to uh, delisting and um, bears are still listed in the NCDE, how is how is this conservation strategy? Is it meeting the needs for which we developed it? Um, and I, you know, so I, I followed through with that um, per Randy's uh, assignment. We met last summer. I, I queried who all from that um, 2017 conservation uh, strategy team was still around. And as you heard in today's introductions, there's been, you know, just a ton of of retirements recently. I think when when we got together last summer, I think the group um, there had already been a 30 percent turnover from the folks that had been in place in the team um, in 2017 and 18. Um, uh, last summer, there's already 30% gone. Now, with more recent retirements, when I look at the list, it's down, you know, 45%. So almost half the people that worked on that strategy um, have moved on. Um, and so there, you know, we'll be needing, you know, to get um, if we continue conversations on this topic, you know, make sure we have all appropriate uh, agencies and and regions and forests are, um, represented. Um, but I, I would just say that um, when we met last summer, um, you know, we did talk about how to keep this document updated a bit. Um, we didn't make any decisions. Um, you know, we had some good conversation, but uh, it was during a transition period in the subcommittee, and um, I think the topic 
we didn't receive any further directions from the subcommittee, and so the, the topic really hasn't progressed any. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, provide this follow up kind of as a tickler to the subcommittee that, um, you know, there might be further discussion needed around this, obviously based on the conversation we just had that that sounds like it's it, it may be true. Um, one suggestion I would have, uh, you know, as Dylan mentioned, you know, he's been kind of the keeper of the document thus far, you know, it's been a largely um, you know, some typos and some clarifications, but some other uh, additions too to the, the the strategy since it was signed in 2018. Um, you know, there have been some edits made to it, and Dylan's been keeping track of those on the uh, on the website. Um, I guess you know, if if that's working fine, uh, that's one thing. Um, I guess a suggestion I had was perhaps that task or that assignment could be taken over by David Diamond, uh, who represents, you know, all the agencies uh, <laughs> as the IGBC executive coordinator. Um, but, you know, Dylan, I understand if you if you really want to keep that, then and we could talk about that too. But I know everybody's busy and I thought maybe this is, you know, from a more interagency approach that that David might be someone um, willing to take that on. Um, so I didn't really have much more than that. I know there's other folks that want to take part of this time slot too for some updates. And um, but I would I would just say that the the topic of the strategy, you know, it is meant to be uh, kind of a living document. And you know how do we do that uh, seems to be a bit unclear at this point. And what you know how to how to make changes that are maybe more substantive versus the more um, you know superficial changes we've talked about in the past. So um, I I guess I would ask, uh, does anybody have any, and, and David, I guess seeing you online here, um, is that a task you'd be willing to accept? And um, and maybe if uh, at the same time asking Dylan if that's a, or the rest of the subcommittee, what, what folks think of of that suggestion that uh, that David kind of, take over some of those responsibilities. I don't want to speak for David, but Dylan gave you a thumbs up. And David, you and I talked and you thought that this was reasonable. I don't want to speak for you, but go ahead and what are your thoughts on, on the proposal? And then yeah, we'll let me just let me test the uh, the idea with the group here. Um, I guess first I just want to offer my appreciation for the, the subcommittee. I mean, the conservation strategy is you know just an incredible document and having reached the milestone of, of getting to signatures in 2018 uh you know and now time has passed since then and diligently you know you've been maintaining uh you know keeping track of of, of small things that that need changing and of course as time goes on the document itself anticipated that um it would there would be a form that it would be the ongoing work of this committee to to keep it up to date. Um, you know, it, it's sort of like having an exercise plan. You know, when can I stop going to the gym? Uh, you know, you, you sort of, if we're in the business of ongoing conservation, uh, that that's gonna require effort for for, for the long term. So um, the this is a, this this belongs to this subcommittee, uh, but on behalf, uh, you know, and, and where the process followed in 2018 was that it, it was, agreed to and worked on and and sweated over in the subcommittee and then signed at that um executive level and I, and I think that's important and of course it hasn't yet been the basis of a, of a delisting rule for the ncde um uh, but it may at some point and uh that that's the i mean that's what how it how it's designed so the the uncertainty about what you know what, what and when that the next step is there um, is real, but the need to keep track of concepts like what the one that Rich just presented, um, where we do have a, a you, know, you know, so it is also there. So I guess I, I yes, I'm absolutely willing as um, the sort of the one employee of this interagency group um, to work on the on behalf of the subcommittee, and then also think about the the how how frequently. I guess that, that hierarchy that Randy just described of you know things that are you know 
grammatical up to maybe more substantive that um, the subcommittee needs to to reach consensus on versus OK, when are we actually going to how frequently do we need new signatures on an on a document that reflects commitments that agencies take back to their own management and put into their own management structures? Um, and um, you know, that that clearly is the the least frequent. Uh, uh, you know, and and, and you know, when you do things like put out a new forest plan, that is a long term commitment. Um, and again, that just is the, the the one of the complexities of this document is that it is a post delisting management strategy that some agencies are have already already made commitments and are and are managing to. So, for example, incorporating things into their their, their plans today. So we're just in that in between phase where you know we're four years past the signing. Uh, we need to keep it maintained and, and ready. Uh, and uh, again, I'm, I'm happy to be sort of the scribe or the the, the, the neutral party uh, to, to help keep track of that um, and, and hopefully you know, support you in your work. Because again, this is the this is the primary product of this subcommittee is that incredible conservation strategy. Yeah, well said, David. So I guess the proposal that I'm hearing, and I can't make a motion, but I guess I'd like to see if there's any discussion before we have a motion is is basically uh, David taking over some of the, I'm going to call it clerical side of the house that uh, Dylan has graciously done up to this point and actually keep it up at your level, all those uh, pen and ink type changes. <laughs> And then uh, if we have any amendments or anything like that, you would also uh, be the keeper of that if we have committee and actually the subcommittee votes on any kind of uh, supplemental into the future. Um, that's what I'm hearing. So any thoughts from subcommittee members before we see if there's a motion? Go ahead, Hillary. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure people know we're doing, we've done this and we're doing it in the Yellowstone ecosystem. So it's, it's a normal thing. The um, Habitat chapter, looking at chapter two, it's reevaluating because things change on the ground. The other thing from the Fish and Wildlife Service perspective, uh, we don't have a proposed rule right now, and we don't know. <laughs> we don't know if we're going to or when, but it's nice not to have to, um, it, it's nice to have time. We have time right now. It's not a fun situation where you know you got to make changes and, you know, you're kind of, you got a real short timeline to do it. So we like the idea of being proactive. And um, I think I was hearing, Scott, maybe you say to, like, we think we need to evaluate it now, right? So we need a, are you looking to get that working group back together? Is that what you were saying? And could David facilitate that? Yeah, I, I guess I would say I'm not looking forward to doing that, but I, I'd be glad to be part of that. But it, there may be a need, I guess. Is, is that's that's kind of the question is, you know, is there a need to follow up and have those more substantive, um, you know, conversations about, about how to keep this document current? And um, if there is, then then maybe, yeah, having you know, a, David play a role in that would be great. I'd be... Um, happy to assist as well. Um, I, I just, I think it, it's timely to have that conversation and kind of figure that out. So what I'll say um, to that, right? So I don't want us to be, I think we should always be looking at it and, and keeping track and seeing if there's changes we need to be making, but I'm not sure we need to dive in and look for changes that we need to be made. So there's a little different. If it comes up from the ground level that, hey, here's definitely one that we need to change because we're hitting a wall or we're doing something or we got new science or whatever, that feels to me like when we would we'd look into it, but just to dive into it, to look to see if we need to update it, feels like a lot of work that we're, that we're possibly putting on agencies uh, that are, at least from the Forest Service standpoint, is already strapped for time. And so I would hate to open up and actually start to try to dive into something and look for concerns versus letting the ground tell us when concerns come up so there's a little difference there Hillary from what I, I just heard you say. yeah no I I agree but I think in the July meeting last year there were some issues that were potential issues that were raised and there were a few people that said let's look into some of these things but Randy, I, mean, I see you on no. go ahead Randy oh I, I I was glad to hear Hillary remind me I I that's how I felt 
the July meeting went as well. And I, I do want to take a moment to recognize Scott for that effort. Um, he was tasked with with reconvening that group, which probably is like a Olympic level cat herding event. But getting that group together in one place to talk again about what what changes we need to make. And to your point, Hillary, I think what this is my own characterization. I think there's some lower level things that we probably could have addressed pretty quickly. And then I there were some conversation threads that were being pulled that started to to seem bigger. They seemed a little more challenging. And it I think that caused the group in July to take a deep breath and wonder how much of this are we going to take on? And and that's kind of tipped the meeting over just a little bit on it seemed started to seem a little bigger than maybe just a, an editing and an updating, a refreshing. Um, so I, I I'm not here to suggest that we don't want to have that conversation. I, I it might be worthwhile even compartmentalizing are there portions that are easy to take on or or identifying those things that that do require that are more substantive that require more thought maybe get those out in front of us as a group so that we can identify if it's that easy if they're if they're discrete just to identify those that we want to tackle that we think we can update the strategies or those that might require enough effort right now or deliberation that we want to pause for a moment on them just just one thought from a corner here yeah, kind of my initial thought to that, Randy, is if it seems like if there's a supplemental, those are the ones that we could probably tackle. If it's opening up the entire conservation strategy, those are ones that we really want to be deliberate and making an informed decision before we go down that path. Does that seem fair to folks? Um, I was trying to open up the document, but my computer's like frozen now. Um, <laughs> but I was, I kind of have a vague recollection that it was kind of something we were going to review on a five-year basis or at least yeah. and so it if we are meant to review it in a five-year basis and we potentially have an impending delisting rule it seems like it, doing it now rather than later would be smart don't you think I'll just speak for a Forest Service standpoint, uh, five years goes by fast. It usually takes us five years to get to a plan. And so I would I would caution us to think that five years is an appropriate time to reopen everything. We'll never have it. And maybe that's OK, but uh, it's been our experience in the agency that we have forest plans that we try to do every 10 years and it's 30 years later before we get to them. So I'm just saying on a workload concern, eh, but the expectation that is that we're going to be updating this conservation strategy every five years. That's that's a tough. That's a tough thing, at least uh, workload wise, I think for us, but I, I wholeheartedly agree that we want to keep it up to date. And I think that's where the supplements might might be able to come into a, account. So I don't know how to how to have this conversation, to be honest with you, um, open to suggestions, but uh, how long did the conservation strategy strategy take us to actually get to signature for those that are around? A couple of years. Ago. How many? A couple years. We started in 2009 through 2013, and then 2017. So it was like a five years. Right. Yeah. So that's the normal. That's the normal experience that I'm used to when we're when we're talking about plans. So again, I want to keep it up up to date. I I feel like that's important. And I feel like the supplemental is a way to, to do that. And then if they substantial, again, if there's something substantial, it needs to come from the ground and we actually need to hear from it as a subcommittee because those are large efforts uh, from my perspective. Can I ask a question? So if the plan stipulates that there's a five year review and everybody signed off on that, is that a commitment to go back and review that and maybe supplemental supplemental? processes are a longer period. I just I want to make sure we're not we're not missing something that we're that the group committed to do. Refer well, Randy and Dylan. Don't quote me on it yet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Remember something about that. Yeah. 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 I, I guess I wasn't part of the, the Scott, you got the group together in July, right? And I think there were some issues identified that we need to look into these things. So um, I think it's just 
that group needs to get back together. But maybe this is the, what needs to happen. That group get back together and look at those issues. Are they really issues that we have? You know, we think we're problem. Yeah, are they substantial enough that we need to actually get them? I mean, that would be, be a question to me. Yeah. Um, Right. That this subcommittee needs to weigh in. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was it was just the initial group to start looking at them. They would raise whatever issues to the subcommittee if they thought that was necessary. Um, Randy. Yes. Go ahead. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Randy, sorry. Yeah. Wish I wish I were in the room. Um. I I I agree with Hillary, <laughs> and I I also agree that we could meet that. Um. It's probably semantics, but a review to me seems a just a a redo of that meeting in July, but just a thoughtful d dive, reconvene, take a look at what needs to be updated, get that back out in front of us, and then we can make a decision on classifying or lumping or splitting those efforts and what what it would take and whether or not we want to really dive into some of those. But I think that review could could allow us to get through that and just get get out in front of us what we need to look at. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, yeah. this is uh, sorry, David. Again, and, and I, I would be happy to to facilitate a conversation like that, and again, ask for the small things, and then you know, see through the that that process if there are other things that people see. Um, just being mindful of yeah, where where this the the need to to sort of keep the garden tended. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to sort of understanding the document better. To, to the point about the the, the periodic review, you know, the document does have a five year review by a body called the, the NCDE Coordinating Committee, which I think is this group. So I just think, you know, touching base there again, it's not in effect because uh, we're not post delisting. So that we have, you know that that's the the pickle that we're in here. Uh, but I think there's the commitment to maintenance um, and seeing what what how things are looking and where there's new uh topics uh like the one that was presented previously that you know how does that reflect it and um i guess that's that's that i guess randy picking up on your point that it does seem like what we did last july but maybe um committing more to creating a list that comes back to this committee in the fall of you know here's here's some you know minor things um and then you know, here's some things we know we want to do later, but then the committee can decide when the appropriate time to do that uh, you know, <laughs> bigger, uh, you know, garden redesign might might be. What folks think of that? It seems reasonable. <clears throat> Seeing some head nods, nods around the room for folks that can't uh, can't see it. So, David, are you David and Scott? Are you two? I guess uh, assignment wise, willing to kind of see that group together and, and be able to report back out uh, if, if possible by should we say the fall meeting subcommittee or should we say the next spring meeting? What time frame folks think? I would think we could we could meet, you know, we could get that input and have something uh, to present uh, like if it's, you know, just a list and, and you know, by this fall. Yeah, I, I agree, Scott. And and I guess the key to me is especially coming into this group uh, as a new new face, um, just making sure that we have the right representation. Uh, you know, folks who are aware of the conservation strategy or have become you know will become aware of it in terms of how it relates back to that their organization's um, you know commitments that tear off of it, uh, just so that we 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 have the complete um, representation and don't miss things. Yeah, to that end, it would be useful, I think, for I don't know how to. Maybe maybe it's just a matter of me getting the list of who's on this at this meeting, because there were a lot of um, new agency representatives on the in, in this meeting today that are, you know, filling in for folks that have left. And that seemed to be one of the one of the concerns was that there's been so much turnover. We need to make sure we're engaging the right group of folks. And so if we can. Um, uh, I guess if I can go either either send me a note, I guess, and let me know that you want to be your agency rep on this group that David and I can um, 
reach out to you. Um, and if I don't see, uh, if I don't get an, every agency's rep, I'll um, I'll look at the, the the list from this meeting, I guess, and pull folks together or reach out to agencies that might be missing and, and get a current rep. That that worked for and and David, you and I can then uh, get together on a on a list of folks to and, and then arrange a, an outreach to them and 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 pull something together this summer. Well, that sounds like a decision, two decision things. One one decision we have on the table is what Scott just mentioned in terms of having, or do we call them a sub subcommittee? <laughs> I think the term is What's the coordinating the committee. Coordinating committee, perfect. Uh, to have the coordinating committee look and re look at and review uh, the conservation strategy. I will say that we can also, as the review comes in, the uh, coordinating committee can say, hey, it looks good. I just want to throw that out there. Um, or we can also have this list, Scott, that you're saying, hey, here's some things that we can do. We think we can do supplemental. Here's some maybe bigger ticket items that we need a little more time to actually think through and look into. So that that to me was one. The other decision that I heard uh, potentially thrown out there, which I'll need a motion for, is to transfer, transfer the the minor changes that Dylan's been keeping track of and put those in David's lap uh, for the coordination. So kind of two motions. Uh, if we can tackle the first one, which I think is easier. Anybody uh, make the motion for transferring the minor? I would, I would make that motion. Neil makes the motion. Anybody seconds it? We'll second, second it. it. Yeah. Rob Gump second it. Uh, all in uh, any discussion. I don't know if I get a vote, but I totally support this. <laughs> <laughs> all right, members all in favor that are in the room say aye. 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 Uh, all who uh, do not favor this say nay. Okay, and I'm hoping I see some thumbs up. I didn't see anybody in the chat. So motion passes. David, you are you will be the now the keeper of that, and I'll let you and Dylan kind of coordinate how that's going to work. And then the other one, um, I don't really know if it's a decision, but more of a just if folks. I'm looking around the room. I, I don't know if we need to need to make a decision, but having a what are we calling that group again? Coordinating committee. Coordinating committee to look at uh, reviewing the the committee or the. Uh, Folks are all right with that. Absolutely. Okay. I'm seeing a lot of head shakes here. I don't see anybody. Anybody not in favor of that? Okay. So Scott and David, between the two of you, if you guys can kind of coordinate and then let me know how I can help uh, get your names from the different agencies, Scott, if you need that, and or David, uh, we can help coordinate that. I think you have kind of a running list of a lot of the the folks that are working behind the scenes, but let us know if we need need some help there. Thank you. <laughs> and then from there, I think we have Mark and Michelle. Or I guess we. Oh, David, did you have an update? Uh, yeah. Could I take a couple minutes, Kurt? Here, I, I uh, apologize. You, I, I thought you might have a few minutes, uh, or do you have something else? We got 15 minutes, David. Go ahead. Okay. Um, is it okay if I share my screen? <laughs> you bet. So, um, thanks again, David Diamond, Executive Coordinator uh, for the IGBC. Uh, the mission of the, of the group, you know, is the recovery and delisting and ongoing conservation of grizzly bear populations. Um, the uh, Dylan mentioned earlier the N the IGBC website. Um, I need to get the membership list updated, which I will. Uh, you you can find meeting materials there. The the, the conservation strategy documents are posted there, um, and um, Dylan also mentioned that you can sign up for notification emails um, going forward. And then another thing I want to mention about the website is that we do have a, a geographic location map for food storage orders. And um, I don't want to steal the thunder of the 
the forests that are going to be reporting this afternoon. But with the with the new storage food storage orders in place, I just need to get those reflected um, on the website here. So if, if folks want to contact me up with, with or send me links. Um, uh, and David, can I that's, ask you on that one? Yeah, absolutely. Here's some exciting news in Region 1. We actually just did a full NCDE 1 full food storage order for all the national forest in the NCDE, which was a huge aspect. So we no longer have multiple food storage orders uh, for each district or each forest or sometimes multiple per forest. It's literally across the whole NCDE. So kudos to everybody. And there's a lot of people behind the scenes, some of them in this room um, that took place. So we, uh, I think that's a good stroke of business for public outreach on that. So you'll be seeing one from the Forest Service uh, from the NCDE uh, that you can update across the board. Yeah, thank you so much. And yeah, again, I don't want to steal the thunder, uh, um, but I, I do want to make sure that we get it reflected on the website so that we get the best information out to people as they're making their plans for recreation. Um, so again, the subcommittees um, have been doing their spring meetings um, and we've, you know, after two years of pandemic, uh, you know, learning how to do meetings online and now learning how to do meetings in a hybrid manner. Um, you know, we, we, we had a, the Yellowstone was an in-person meeting. We had a, 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 a audio recording uh, available after the fact. Um, thrilled to have this owl technology today. It's amazing. I can really see you, although I'm, you know, obviously we would prefer to be with you. Um, and uh, the executives are going to be meeting this summer, and that's likely going to be, I mean, a, a purely in-person. It's a field meeting, so we'll have to think about how we convene and, and work together and interact and make sure that. Uh, uh, the, the, we have the coordination and we also have the the, the availability of information uh, for the public as well. So um, that's our schedule for this year. Uh, and in, the, in March, we had a virtual meeting with the executives and, and did some very high level strategic planning, which we're going to try to pick up on in uh, in July. And you heard a lot there from from Dylan and from Hillary and others. Um, you know, there was there was energy on this conflict reduction topic and um, we have some uh, initiatives launched to try to um, make progress there and thinking about, you know, that the, the, the Airbnb VRBO topic was an interesting one of you know, where where is the work? Where is, can we do work that's going to be uh, make progress at the ecosystem scale versus where do we really need to work at a statewide or, or even region wide level? Um, you know, if we can get a connection with those companies and, and get something that carries through the whole region, that, that clearly would be uh, something that would be very helpful. So um, we're, we're doing some work with the bear resistant product testing program or the, the, the how we do our budgeting. So you heard the report from Dylan about dollars going to IEO projects and there may be some changes in, in priority and in, in, in how we handle those. Um, and we're updating the website for the bear resistant product testing program to make that a more um, sort of user friendly experience for, for consumers, especially to, to find the product that they want to know about or to look at a category of products so they can sort of search, have a searchable database. Uh, and then, you know, again, this conflict reduction is a big topic. And I know there's work, tremendous work from the NCDE subcommittee. Uh, and your subcommittee had work that was, you know, you, you had the shooting related and the transportation related automobile train, and then this broader site conflict work. And again, we're I continue to be curious about how do we empower the subcommittee to continue that kind of work, but also how can we maybe look at things at a more region wide scale? And so for um, for community efforts, you know, we're trying to add a, 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 this idea of a bear smart community. So there's been a, a group and Dylan mentioned that's been working on that. Lori Roberts has been um, spearheading that group to allow communities to have access to a set of tools that uh, you know if they if they decide voluntarily to go down that path um, at the other end of it it could be a, a certification that comes to them from the IGBC in the same way that we certify bear resistant products and just you know create that sort of carrot uh, approach uh, and incentivize uh, work um, on 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 food storage uh, uh, securing and and those sorts of things and and then a pinch potentially maybe making some resources or finding resources available to those communities um, to, to help them with that work. And then also on you know information education outreach and reaching these people that are visiting 
um, you know, we're looking ahead to next year and, and, and revisiting the uh, IEO subcommittee and looking for messages that work. So, I mean, for this subcommittee, again, we talked about the conservation strategy um, as the basis for delisting is, is the is the you know just an incredible product, uh, an incredible collaborative effort, um, and that work will continue for the long term in the ongoing um, conservation. And so, I'm curious, and as you meet here and, and discuss uh, do the agency reports, you know, thinking about what Kurt's going to be presenting to the executives in December about. Um, where you're making progress this year and, and, and how you want to align your resources uh, for this ecosystem. Um, and really, that's what I had. I've, you know, there's some more detail coming on Bear Smart that I can go into if you'd like. Um, and, you know, again, I'm, I'm happy to be on board. It's, I've, I've, it's been interesting to learn about the different committees, and I do think it's going to be helpful that I'm going to serve a, a sort of a similar role uh, for the Yellowstone Ecosystem Subcommittee with their conservation strategy and um, hopefully <coughs> streamline or make more efficient the communication back and forth um, between this working group and, and with the uh, with the executive committee. Any questions for David? By the way, it feels like a movie right now. We've been sitting here for two and a half hours in case you were wondering. So kudos <laughs> to the board. I didn't see anybody, you know, too many folks get out for a bathroom break. So, <clears throat> David, uh, anybody else? Uh, question for David or, or Scott? Anybody online? All right. So, in an effort to uh, keep us on track. We're five minutes ahead of time. I'm going to give five minutes a break, followed by an hour lunch. <laughs> um, with that, if you all can be back by uh, 1230, we'll, we'll start up 1230 sharp. Again, for those of you that are going to lunch, head east, right down Reserve Street, and there's a lot of fast food, Jimmy John's. If you go to McKenzie River, there for an hour, perhaps in terms of uh, making that It'll be a stretch for you all, so I'd suggest something a little bit faster, but there are some options, uh, including Costco, if you like hot dogs and, and a drink. Uh, <laughs> so so with that, if you guys have any uh, suggestions, by all means, get with me during lunch. We'll see you at 1230. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.